If anyone can say he's had a storybook life, it's Prince William. The first-born son of England's beloved Princess Diana, and the second in line after his father, Prince Charles, to become king. In 1981, the world watched on as Prince Charles married Lady Diana Spencer in a lavish wedding ceremony at St. Paul's Cathedral. In June the following year, the royals welcomed their first son, His Royal Highness Prince William Arthur Philip Louis Windsor of Wales. The fairy tale took a tragic turn when William and his younger brother Harry lost their mother when they were just 15 and 12. William matured into an accomplished Prince Charming, who in 2002 was taken off the market by fellow St Andrews College student Kate Middleton. The prince and officer in the Royal Army married in a fairy tale ceremony at London's Westminster Abbey on April 29, 2011. ennobling the royal duo as the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. George VI broke with tradition by marrying commoner Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon who had previously rejected two of his proposals, as she was reluctant to make the sacrifices necessary to become a member of the royal family. The couple enjoyed 16 years of marriage, until George passed away, age 56. The Queen Mother was left to live life as a widow for the next 50 years, until her death. Queen Elizabeth's marriage to Prince Philip was a rare bright spot in the history of royal weddings. Although it is believed that the Queen Mother initially opposed the union because Philip had no financial standing and was foreign born. In 1947, the wedding provided Britain with a morale boost in the tough post war period. The wedding of the century was between Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer in 1981. The couple were married at St. Paul's Cathedral before an estimated television audience of 750 million. In less than a year, the couple produced their first child, William. But by then, Prince Charles' long-running relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles was putting strain on the marriage. It was said that Diana felt like she was living in a marriage of three people. The union was formally ended with a decree absolute in 1996, and Diana died in a car crash the following year. Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was born on April 21st, 1926. She was the first child of the Duke and Duchess of York, subsequently King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. Four years later, she gained a sister, Princess Margaret. It was decided that the princess's life was to be as normal as possible. No longer was the future monarch to be sheltered from her people's concerns by royal excess and opulence. Instead, she was to understand the inescapable reality of a nation still coming to terms with the effects of the First World War. When aged just 11, her grandfather, the King, died. Her uncle Edward abdicated the throne a few months later, making Elizabeth's father King, and she became second in line to the throne. After World War II, the princess accompanied her parents on a tour of South Africa, and on her 21st birthday, she pledged her devotion to the monarchy. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me. 
as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow. And God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Elizabeth married Prince Philip of Greece in 1947. And a year later, Elizabeth gave birth to their first son, Prince Charles. The nation rejoiced at the news of the birth of the prince. Two years later, Princess Anne was born, a sister for the prince. The health of King George VI declined during 1951. On a stopover in Kenya, the princess was brought the news that her father had passed away. Elizabeth immediately returned home. For now, she had ascended to the throne. The coronation finally took place in Westminster Abbey on June 2, 1953, despite the death of Elizabeth's grandmother, Queen Mary, several months earlier. At Elizabeth's request, the ceremony was broadcast on television and radio around the world. Television was in its relative infancy and brought home the splendor and the deep significance of the event to hundreds of thousands of people in a way never before possible. The kingdom that Queen Elizabeth II inherited from her father was a confident one. The war had ended and 1953 proved to be a golden year that imbued Britain with a sense of optimism. Most importantly, the nation was brimming with affection and hope for its new young queen. She proved herself to be the perfect model of a modern monarch and bore the immense burden of public expectation both gracefully and willingly. Despite the jubilation for the new queen, the British government believed some countries might drop out of the empire. It was Prime Minister Winston Churchill who stated, we've got this film star of a queen, let's send her out on a global charm offensive. In 1980, at 18 years of age, Diana joined the royal family for a weekend hunt at Sandringham. A string of requests from Charles followed over the next six months. The monarchy reportedly also considered Princess Astrid of Luxembourg as a suitable match for Charles, even though she was Catholic. But the tabloids pursued Diana as the main romantic interest of Charles. Her flat was under constant surveillance by the paparazzi, and she was followed wherever she went. Although the shy 19-year-old was suddenly thrust into the media spotlight, she still cared for all of those who came into contact with her. In February 1981, the wait was over. Buckingham Palace announced that Prince Charles and Lady Diana were engaged. Diana, who was not yet 20 years old, was infatuated with her new fiancé. She stated that as long as he was by her side, she could do anything. Yesterday you were a nanny looking after children. Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales and, and one day you would, all, in all likelihood, be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. On July 29, 1981, the wedding of the century had finally arrived. At Buckingham Palace, the Queen and Prince Philip set off in the procession bound for St. Paul's Cathedral. While Prince Charles was accompanied by his brother Andrew. Lady Diana, at just 20 years of age, emerged from Clarence House, ready to become the future Queen of England. 
Diana's silk wedding dress has since become an iconic moment in fashion history. Set against the drama of St. Paul's Cathedral and the British monarchy, Diana's ivory silk dress was suitably breathtaking, perfectly befitting a princess. Designed by David and Elizabeth Emmanuel, it featured a 25-foot train, 10,000 small pearls, elegant lace and sequin detailing, and those iconic puff sleeves. However, the designers hadn't considered the glass carriage Diana would travel in, and when she arrived at St. Paul's Cathedral, her 9,000-pound dress was crumpled. Engaged on official duties and bound to a husband who had brought his fishing gear and books along to his honeymoon, the princess's fairy tale wedding did not necessarily translate into a fairy tale honeymoon. Princess Diana endured 17 hours of labour when her firstborn William was finally born on June 21, 1982, at St. Mary's Hospital. At the christening, he wore a lace gown that was made for Queen Victoria's eldest daughter. He was named His Royal Highness, Prince William of Wales, although it's said that he was affectionately called Wombat and Wills by his parents. Prince Charles was overjoyed with William's arrival into the family, as now the royal succession was absolute. Diana was a proactive parent. She insisted on taking nine-month-old William on an official visit to Australia. Her decision to travel together as a family was considered to be unconventional. Not only was William so young, but both the first and second in line for the throne would be travelling together. During his first photo shoot in New Zealand, the fair-haired little boy with blue eyes demonstrated he was far from camera shy. At the age of three, on his first day of nursery school, it was evident that giving the press a photo opportunity was already second nature. Diana was a fun-loving mother to Wills. She even took part in a parent's race at the Weatherby School Sports Day. His first official public engagement took place when he was eight years old on St. David's Day in Wales. Here it was revealed that he was left-handed, like his great-grandfather, King George VI. Whilst attending Eton College, his parents' deeply troubled marriage weighed heavily on William. Despite the pressures and expectations of the monarchy, Diana was determined to raise William and Harry as normally as possible. She took her boys to Canada for a fun family vacation. She also exposed her children to the suffering of the world by taking them to homeless shelters and hospital wards. It was important to her that William, as a future king, realised he was part of a multi-racial society where poverty, war and disease were present. Their relationship was close. Diana was quoted describing him as the man in my life. She relied upon her eldest son for comfort and advice. It was said that Wills even announced that he wanted to be a policeman when he grew up so that he could protect his mother. Harry replied, You can't. You've got to be king. By the age of nine, he had already learned how to book a table at San Lorenzo, Diana's favourite restaurant to cheer her up. It's believed that William later advised her to accelerate her divorce proceedings by agreeing to be stripped of her royal title. Reassuring her, you'll still be mummy. Throughout Diana's life, she used her high profile to help over 100 charities all around the world. In 1995, Diana received the International Humanitarian of the Year Award from the United Cerebral Palsy Fund. This award recognised her work with children. The princess was most publicly noted for her charity work and stance against landmines. 
Photos of Diana walking through a minefield wearing a ballistic helmet and flak jacket brought a great deal of publicity to the issue. Perhaps her most inspiring work was when she became the first high-profile person to knowingly touch people with HIV virus. In the last year of her life, she focused her attention onto six charities. Centrepoint Soho, the Leprosy Mission, here she again made the point of touching the children with the condition, the International Red Cross, the National AIDS Trust, the Great Ormond Street Hospital, Royal Marsden NHS Trust, dedicated to cancer treatment and research. The Diana Princess of Wales Memorial Fund was established after her death. Its mission is to continue her humanitarian work in the United Kingdom and overseas. In the early hours on August 31, 1997, whilst holidaying in Balmoral, William awoke to the news that his mother had been fatally wounded in a car accident in Paris. William, aged 15, and Harry, 12, returned to London to view the mass of floral tributes left by members of the public and to meet some of the mourners and well-wishers who crowded outside his mother's home at Kensington Palace. At the funeral, William and Harry insisted on performing the gruelling task of walking behind the gun carriage that carried their mother's coffin to Westminster Abbey. Their father, grandfather and maternal uncle accompanied the boys on this harrowing walk. Despite being deeply affected by the loss of their mother, the boys displayed great composure and dignity throughout the funeral service that stopped a nation. My brother and I were lucky enough to grow up supported by the love and nurturing of our family. They saw to our education, our health, our well-being and every other need. Throughout the Prince's childhood, his mother Diana exposed William to numerous charities. Following her death, he was destined to continue her good work and legacy. William and Harry formed their own charitable foundation and became patrons of many of the charities that their mother supported. William is dedicated to making a difference by becoming involved with charities, rather than just being a royal ornament by simply attending opening ceremonies. The Prince is the patron of Centrepoint. This charity assists the homeless. In a bid to raise awareness and to genuinely understand the problem, he slept out overnight in the streets of London. Again following his mother's footsteps, he became patron of the Royal Marsden Hospital. He gained first-hand experience by working in the children's unit and helped out in the medical research, catering and fundraising departments. The Prince spent two weeks with the Mountain Rescue England and Wales team. He became involved with this charity to highlight the selfless and courageous work of the volunteers. William was delighted when asked to become the Royal Patron of Tusk Trust. He and Harry witnessed the charity's work when visiting Africa. The charity's projects include conserving wildlife, community development projects, and providing educational facilities across the continent. William and Harry teamed up again to take part in the Enduro Africa Motorcycle Challenge. The eight-day race raised money for UNICEF, Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, and Prince Harry's Centrebelle Charity. They also became joint patrons of the Henry Van Straubenzee Memorial Fund, 
This charity supports schools in Uganda. Henry was one of Prince William's closest childhood friends. When aged just 18, he tragically died in a car crash. During his teenage years, Prince William enrolled at Eton College, one of England's most prestigious secondary schools. He was a serious student with excellent grades and also excelled in sports. His mother, Diana, encouraged William to live as normal life as possible. Emotionally affected by the media's influence on his parents' divorce and his mother's tragic death, William has publicly stated his dislike for the press and seems uncomfortable with the growing attention he receives from love-struck adolescent girls. William gives the impression of being a well-mannered, responsible and mature young man who shows a strong sense of duty and loyalty to the royal family, fully aware of the role he is to play in the future as the King of England. In his final year at Eton, Prince William excels at his studies. He shows remarkable leadership qualities and is well liked by his classmates. He enjoys playing soccer and polo. He also captains the Eton swim team. After graduation, William took a year off to tour Africa and Chile. Upon his return, William and Charles visited Glasgow and Scotland. Whilst there, they visited some of the most impoverished areas in the city and met with drug addicts and asylum seekers. The day ended on a solemn note, with Charles and William signing the 9-11 condolence book at the American Embassy. William then entered the University of St Andrews. In an interview marking the start of his university career, he insisted, I just want to go to university and have fun. I want to be an ordinary student. I'm particularly good of him to uh, alter his uh, sleeping habits in order to, to be here. Uh, <laughs> Morning. He was very worried that I was going to embarrass him, but I succeeded in doing it. William participated in a typical college life, going to bars and socialising with his friends and girlfriend Kate Middleton. But it's impossible to be ordinary when you're second in line to the throne. He was the first member of the British royal family to have a set of stamps issued to mark his 21st birthday. At this time, he stated, I want people to call me William for now. I don't want all the formalities because they're not needed for the time being. Rumours circulated in the press that he didn't want to inherit the throne. He responded by saying, it's something I was born into and it's my duty. These stories about me not wanting to be king are all wrong. It's a very important role and one that I don't take lightly. In a bid to allow William's studies to be paparazzi-free, the royal family gave the press stage managed photo opportunities and regular updates on the prince's lives. Oh, what have we done wrong? <laughs> I'm coming up. You've got a very carefully planned, I see. What makes you think that? So, Prince William, romance here. clearly in the air here. Uh, could there be another wedding perhaps on the card sometime soon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. Back to us. <laughs> A lot of coverage this morning, William, of uh, Kate. I wonder how you feel about that and how she's bearing up under the scrutiny. I haven't seen any of it. I'm just gagging it on the slopes, basically. Simple as that. Right. Sadly, their right. skiing holiday in Switzerland was cut short by the news that at the age of 101, the Queen Mother had passed away in his sleep. Following in the footsteps of his younger brother, Prince Harry, William joined the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst as a military cadet and received his commission as a second lieutenant. In 2008, he was appointed to be a royal knight companion of the most noble order of the Garter. William had plenty of moral support at the graduation ceremony and did well to contain his laughter when the Queen spoke to him while inspecting the troops. William then officially received his commission as second lieutenant. He expressed a desire to participate in active service, but being second in line to the throne there were grave concerns for his safety. 
William continued his military training in the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force. He enrolled in an intensive four-month training course at RAF Cranwell Training Unit and enjoyed his first flight as a pilot. Well, I've still had a telltale and I haven't been built for a plane, so, so far it looks all right. But um, it was one of those experiences where I thought it'll never come round. And I thought, you know, hopefully a bit longer yet, I'll get more practice. And the next thing I know, my instructor jumps out and goes, go on, get on with it. And I was left there sort of looking around there and go, uh, what? So uh, I just did it and once you get up in the air, it was fine. It wasn't so bad. William helped to man a C-17 Globemaster flight to Afghanistan, during which he assisted in the repatriation of the body of a trooper, Robert Pearson. It is said that his fellow crew affectionately gave him the nickname Billy the Fish, a pun on his title. Upon completing the course, he was presented with his RAF wings by his father, Charles, who had also received his wings after training at the same unit. This was a proud and happy day for all at the ceremony. <laughs> William then started his Navy training in the Caribbean island of Montserrat. During his training, the Prince took part in a secret underwater mission and helped to identify and capture a small vessel that had been transporting a vast quantity of cocaine. Southern Tense Wales' uh, presence uh, uh, in HMS Iron Duke has, uh, has made absolutely no difference to the way I conduct my operations. He is, uh, he, he's integrated entirely into my ship's company. Uh, what I'm able to do is expose him, as, which is my remit from senior officers, to expose him to every facet of naval operations uh, as they unfold. After a stint with the Army Air Corps, it was announced that he would transfer to the RAF in order to train as a full-time search and rescue helicopter pilot. This enables him to take an active role as a member of the armed forces without being deployed on combat operations. William then began training in Shawbury, where Harry was training as an Army Air Corps helicopter pilot. It's quite a special moment for you, isn't it? I mean, this is possibly the last time you've all been living together. First and last time we'll be living together. Yeah. It's, it's, about. Been, it's been a fairly emotional experience. Yeah. How much inter-service rivalry is there between you two? None at all. No, not at all really. I mean, everyone, oh, everyone knows the army is better than the army. I'm a cavalry boy anyway, so it's uh, it's fine. Wouldn't There's good bands so. between army pilots and the RF uh, pilots, obviously as well. The naval pilots just you know in the background they didn't do anything, so it's fine. And would you live together again? In a much experience being. Same. Well, bearing in mind I cook him and feed him basically every day, I think he's, uh, he's done rather well. Harry told us the other week that he did all the washing up. He does do a bit of the washing up, then he leaves most of it in the sink and then it comes back in the morning and I have to wash it up. <laughs> oh, the lies. Yeah, <laughs> oh, <my laughs> Do you end up finding yourself tidying up after him? Or? Yeah, a fair bit of tidying. He snores a lot as well, keeps me out all night long. I think we're showing a bad night. <laughs> so, no, I don't know awesome. that. I think that's very important we say that. And it's, it's somebody's birthday on, on Sunday. Um, are you a bit nervous? Any, any presents you want um, your brother to get for you? Basically, he's probably only literally just realised that you said that Thanks now that. And, uh, <laughs> and hasn't got me a present, but uh, I wouldn't expect anything else anyway. It's, uh, I'll be lucky to get a card. Uh, it's going very well, Rocket. It's, um, it's been. Um, I've moved obviously off from the school because uh, now being a far superior RF pilot, I've now moved on to the Griffin. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's good fun. It, you know, I've got more of a crew atmosphere, so I've got guys in the back, and it's really weird. You're flying along, and you get these random voices coming your ear that you're not, you, you can't even see, and uh, you've got to sort of respond. Yeah, exactly. They're usually <laughs> hanging off a skid. Yeah, voices just random voices. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's good fun. It's um, it's quite a long way to go yet before I'm finished, but um, I'm looking forward to you know the few challenges ahead and, and flying. So, to me, I didn't join the forces to be, like I said a lot of times before, molly cuddled or treated any different. And as far as I'm concerned, in my eyes, if Harry can do it, then I can do it. Uh, I don't really separate us in that much difference. And I think as a future head of the armed forces, it's really important that I was get, you get, at least get the opportunity uh, to be credible and to do the job that I signed up for uh, and to do the best I can. I and mean, that's all I ever wanted to do. And the search and rescue role is now, you know, slightly different so obviously being able to go to Afghanistan but it's still doing an important job and yeah, I hope that it's yeah I hope it's just in the right direction exactly for the future. Due to William's future role in the monarchy, a long-term career in the military is unlikely. From birth it was destined that William would be an ambassador for the monarchy. But the royal family would not have expected his popularity to be as great as it is. William is a passionate environmentalist. 
William and his father attended a brokerage firm to help out at the company's annual charity fancy dress day. As William attended the phones petitioning for donations, it was reported that Charles asked, is he offering you a wedding present? With Wills replying, he's asked me if I will marry his daughter. The day raised 64 million pounds Skillforce, another charity that William supports, received a share of the proceeds. Skillforce aims to unlock the potential of disadvantaged young people and to help them to be prepared for life after school and find employment. William and Harry attended the City Salute, London's tribute to the British Armed Forces. The young royals called upon Britain to show its gratitude for the selfless courage of the armed services. The event raised almost £1 million for wounded servicemen. Later that day, the princes visited Headley Court Rehabilitation Centre to offer moral support to wounded veterans. Having lost someone so close in similar circumstances, Harry and I understand how important it is to keep their memory alive. There is no finer way than that which Alex and Claire have chosen. This is the first charity of which we are both patrons, and it couldn't be a better one. As Henry was such a very close friend of ours, and because we believe so strongly in the need to alleviate poverty and assist development in African countries, such as Uganda. William and Harry's greatest fundraising charity event was a concert for Diana. The event was staged to celebrate their mother's life on the 10th anniversary of her death. wanted to have this big concert with you know full of energy full of um, sort of fun and happiness which I knew she would have wanted and on her birthday as well it's got to be the best birthday present she's ever had and with it we can by the two of us um, organizing it um, we wanted to have the uh, the fact that the evening is all about our, our mother uh, the main purpose is to celebrate and, and to have fun and to remember her in, in a fun way we've got Sils and John um, we've got the English National Ballet um, Andrew Lloyd Webber is doing a um, exclusive sort of uh, greatest hits um, bit, and then we've got uh, Pharrell Joss Williams and Joss, Pharrell Williams and Joss Stone. There's plenty, plenty more. Um, don't worry. That's a little flavour. <laughs> what does your bit consist of, and which one of you, you would you say is the most natural performer? <laughs> natural performer. Uh, Joss. Right in front of me. That's wicked. Thank yeah, you, exactly, darling. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, the idea is we wanted to get um. Uh, artists that our mother really uh, loved, um, and then um, artists that both Harry and I enjoyed. The who's who of the entertainment industry donated their services in support of the boys and the much-loved People's Princess. I met her a long time ago, and, and William and Harry, they were wee little kids, you know. They probably don't even remember it, <laughs> but uh, they probably don't even know who I am. But uh, yeah, I remember meeting her, sweet lady, and what's really cool about this whole thing is that, you know, there's, there's positives and negatives in anybody's life. But what's great is that everybody remembers the wonderful things she stood for. What I see is a mom, you know, especially through William and Harry. I see a mom. You know, I think that I think that the world, not just Americans, but the world had a bond with her because she was so genuine about really being true. Really being true and honest. And, and from royalty, sometimes you don't expect that they're going to give you that realism of character. And, you know, because of what they're supposed to do or because of the honor they're supposed to hold, you expect not someone to kiss a child with AIDS and you don't expect the certain things that, that Diana has been known and will always be known for her valor in, in strength. And so I think that um, America's as well as the world's, I mean, they're all watching. The concert was a huge success, attracting a crowd of 62,000 in the stadium and watched on television by millions more around the world. The £1.2 million raised ensured that eight charities received at least £150,000 each from the proceeds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Since birth, William's personal life has been the subject of great media attention. The Prince regularly participates in charity polo matches. Despite being left-handed, which is a disadvantage in the sport, 
He is skilled and very competitive. Although Kate suffers from an allergy to horses, she has been a regular feature on the sidelines of polo fields throughout the course of their relationship. Proceeds of this event went to the child bereavement charity of which William is a patron. Their mission is for all bereaved children and grieving families to have access to support from trained professionals. The mature, sensitive prince that we know today is a result of an incredibly unique life, which has been one of privilege and adversity. On a trip to Australia, William paid a visit to the community of Flowerdale, which was living in temporary housing, having lost their homes in the Black Friday bushfires. The prince then enjoyed a game of cricket with some of the local children. There's that other guy with the ginger hair, who just never ever stops banging on about you, and I haven't lived because I haven't been to Australia, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> While attending Ludgrove School in Berkshire, William was admitted to hospital after having been hit on the side of the forehead with a golf club by a fellow student. The prince suffered a depressed fracture of the skull that required surgery. This left him with a permanent scar. His mother remained at his bedside whilst Charles became the subject of widespread negative criticism in the press when he continued with his scheduled engagements that evening. Prince William followed in the footsteps of his late mother and the Queen Mother when he was made an honorary barrister at the Middle Temple Hall. The honorary degree gives William the opportunity to meet with barristers and members of the judiciary to develop an understanding of how the law operates. At the ceremony, it was reported that William promised not to practice as a barrister, except for contesting the odd speeding ticket. It's apparent that William possesses great confidence, maturity and sensitivity. At a similar age, his father, Prince Charles, seemed awkward and uncertain. Royal insiders have suggested that the Queen may choose to overlook Charles and grant William the next succession to the throne. But apart from William's rising popularity, the British royal family is not faring too well. In 1990, 75% of Britons thought that the country would be worse off without a monarch. A decade later, the figure was down to 44%, and calls to modernise the country, including the abolition of the monarchy, have become louder since, as more and more Brits are concerned that the royal family is not quite what it used to be. While pro-royals argue that the crown promotes integration, is a symbol of the kingdom's unity, is totally harmless and a boost to tourism, critics accuse the monarchy of trapping its subjects in an infantile fairyland, and national delusion giving the crown fault for breeding small-mindedness, Euroscepticism and conservatism. Dissatisfaction reached an all-time high in the 90s, a development which was closely tied to the antics of the family members, including three busted marriages and a prince sent to a South London rehabilitation centre for young hard drug addicts. More recently, royal commentators have been following his relationship with Kate Middleton which began in 2003 while attending St. Andrew's University. The prince had developed a great disdain for the paparazzi and believes they contributed to his mother's death. The royal family moved to shield William from the press by providing tabloids with regular updates of his life. He switched his main subject from art history to geography and excelled. He graduated the same year as Kate with upper second class honors the highest honours awarded to any heir of the British throne. 
Rumours of a possible engagement swirled around the pair. Middleton attended Williams' passing out parade at Sandhurst. This was the first high-profile event she attended as his guest, and speculation grew. The relationship was followed so closely that bookmakers took bets on the possibility of a royal wedding. Media attention became so intense that William made a specific request to the press to keep their distance from Kate. It was an all too familiar sight for the monarchy. In the lead up to Diana's engagement, she too was besieged by the media. In March 2007, Middleton complained of media harassment by the Daily Mirror. The possibility of legal action against the media was raised. News International responded by banning all its newspapers from using paparazzi pictures of Middleton. The media's focus on Kate was so sharp that when she received a parking ticket near her Chelsea home, it made headlines and the evening news. We understand that nobody, uh, nobody likes getting a parking ticket, but we have to make sure that we fairly and consistently enforce the rules and regulations, which is what happened here. And I'm very pleased that Kate, uh, Kate was very gracious about the way in which the, uh, about the, uh, receiving the ticket, as you would expect from someone who uh, may well be the future Queen of England. By April 2007, the tabloids need to know became too much for Kate. The Sun newspaper reported that the couple had split during a holiday in the Swiss resort of Zermatt. There was a great deal of speculation about the possible reasons for the split. Some said that Kate felt William had not been paying her enough attention and photos emerged of William in a nightclub partying with young women. Other reports stated that he had received advice from members of the royal family not to rush into marriage. William also went on the record saying that he was far too young to marry. Several months later, the couple resumed their relationship. Kate attended a party at Lulworth Army Barracks as Prince William's guest. It was said that the Queen expressed a private desire that the couple should date for at least five years and that Middleton should first secure a proper full-time job before the couple announced their engagement. Finally, on November 16, 2010, it was announced that Prince William and Kate Middleton were engaged. The prince popped the question during a holiday in Kenya. William gave Kate his mother's famous diamond and sapphire engagement ring. The wedding date was set for April 29, 2011. The funds raised from the broadcast rights of Kate and William's first interview, after announcing their engagement, were donated to charity. In 2011, William and Kate were married. William and Kate exchanged vows at Westminster Abbey and became the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. The groom broke with tradition and sported the scarlet uniform of the Colonel of the Irish Guard for the royal wedding where his brother served as best man. Settling into their lives as newlyweds, William and Kate embarked on an 11-day North American tour from Canada to Los Angeles, where the duo mingled with A-listers, such as Jennifer Lopez and Nicole Kidman. In contrast, the controversial royal wedding between the divorcee's Prince Charles of Wales and Mrs. Camilla Parker Bowles in 2005 was a much lower key event. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip did not attend their son's civil wedding ceremony, but they were present at the blessing service and held a reception for the couple at Windsor Castle. William served as a witness at his father's second marriage. Only time will tell if Charles and Camilla would become the next king and queen. In February 2008, he became the second oldest person in British history to be heir to the throne. If he succeeds his mother as king and uses his first name as his ruling name, he will become Charles III. 
However, it is possible that he may take the title George VII in honour of his grandfather, George VI. The heir apparent is Prince William. His Royal Highness William Arthur Philip Louis Windsor, also nicknamed Wills, Dreamboat Willie, Billy and Wombat, will one day be King William V. With his dashing good looks and self-effacing charm, he has already emerged as the royal family's major sex symbol. Hundreds of websites by infatuated young ladies are dedicated to the second in line to the throne. The unexpected result is said to be attributed to the Prince William photo effect. The strapping young lad has so managed to charm the younger section of the public that Britain's next generation may well forget all current royal blues. Despite the royal family's ups and downs, the Queen still remains a dignified figure in the United Kingdom. She is grudgingly respected even by her Republican subjects and regarded as a leading figure, despite her rather cool and collected airs. Today, the role of the reigning crown has fundamentally changed to a mere representative role. These days, kings and queens need to show up at all kinds of events and hold speeches on all kinds of topics. Prince Charles talks on subjects ranging from globalization and rural decline to alternative medicine, bringing deeply rooted traditions in harmony with modern day expectations of the royal family is no easy task. According to Prince Charles, the art of living lies in striking a balance and composing harmony out of opposites is a sacred thing. As Queen Elizabeth nears the last legs of her reign, it will soon be up to her young heirs to master the opposites of both traditional and progressive ideas, history and future. If anyone can say he's had a storybook life, it's Prince William. The first-born son of England's beloved Princess Diana, and the second in line after his father, Prince Charles, to become king. In 1981, the world watched on as Prince Charles married Lady Diana Spencer in a lavish wedding ceremony at St. Paul's Cathedral. In June the following year, the royals welcomed their first son, His Royal Highness Prince William Arthur Philip Louis Windsor of Wales. The fairy tale took a tragic turn when William and his younger brother Harry lost their mother when they were just 15 and 12. William matured into an accomplished Prince Charming, who in 2002 was taken off the market by fellow St Andrews College student Kate Middleton. The prince and officer in the Royal Army married in a fairy tale ceremony at London's Westminster Abbey on April 29, 2011. ennobling the royal duo as the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. George VI broke with tradition by marrying commoner Lady Elizabeth Bowes to the throne a few months later, making Elizabeth's father king, and she became second in line to the throne. After World War II, the princess accompanied her parents on a tour of South Africa, and on her 21st birthday, she pledged her devotion to the monarchy. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service 
and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Elizabeth married Prince Philip of Greece in 1947, and a year later, Elizabeth gave birth to their first son, Prince Charles. The nation rejoiced at the news of the birth of the prince. Two years later, Princess Anne was born, a sister for the prince. The health of King George VI declined during 1951. On a stopover in Kenya, the princess was brought the news that her father had passed away. Elizabeth immediately returned home. For now, she had ascended to the throne. The coronation finally took place in Westminster Abbey on June 2, 1953, despite the death of Elizabeth's grandmother, Queen Mary, several months earlier. At Elizabeth's request, the ceremony was broadcast on television and radio around the world. Television was in its relative infancy and brought home the splendor and the deep significance of the event to hundreds of thousands of people in a way never before possible. The kingdom that Queen Elizabeth II inherited from her father was a confident one. The war had ended and 1953 proved to be a golden year that imbued Britain with a sense of optimism. Most importantly, the nation was brimming with affection and hope for its new young queen. She proved herself to be the perfect model of a modern monarch and bore the immense burden of public expectation both gracefully and willingly. Despite the jubilation for the new queen, the British government believed some countries might drop out of the empire. It was Prime Minister Winston Churchill who stated, we've got this film star of a queen, let's send her out on a global charm offensive. In 1980, at 18 years of age, Diana joined the royal family for a weekend hunt at Sandringham. A string of requests from Charles followed over the next six months. The monarchy reportedly also considered Princess Astrid of Luxembourg as a suitable match for Charles, even though she was Catholic. But the tabloids pursued Diana as the main romantic interest of Charles. Her flat was under constant surveillance by the paparazzi, and she was followed wherever she went. Although the shy 19-year-old was suddenly thrust into the media spotlight, she still cared for all of those who came into contact with her. In February 1981, the wait was over. Buckingham Palace announced that Prince Charles and Lady Diana were engaged. Diane, who had previously rejected two of his proposals, as she was reluctant to make the sacrifices necessary to become a member of the royal family. The couple enjoyed 16 years of marriage until George passed away, age 56. The Queen Mother was left to live life as a widow for the next 50 years until her death. Queen Elizabeth's marriage to Prince Philip was a rare bright spot in the history of royal weddings. Although it is believed that the Queen Mother initially opposed the union because Philip had no financial standing and was foreign born. In 1947, the wedding provided Britain with a morale boost in the tough post-war period. The wedding of the century was between Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer in 1981. The couple were married at St. Paul's Cathedral before an estimated television audience of 750 million. In less than a year, the couple produced their first child, William. But by then, Prince Charles' long-running relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles was putting strain on the marriage. 
It was said that Diana felt like she was living in a marriage of three people. The union was formally ended with a decree absolute in 1996, and Diana died in a car crash the following year. Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was born on April 21, 1926. She was the first child of the Duke and Duchess of York, subsequently King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. Four years later, she gained a sister, Princess Margaret. It was decided that the princess's life was to be as normal as possible. No longer was the future monarch to be sheltered from her people's concerns by royal excess and opulence. Instead, she was to understand the inescapable reality of a nation still coming to terms with the effects of the First World War. When aged just 11, her grandfather, the king, died. Her uncle Edward abdicated. Diana, who was not yet 20 years old, was infatuated with her new fiancé. She stated that as long as he was by her side, she could do anything. Yesterday you were a nanny looking after children. Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales and, and one day you would, well, in all likelihood, be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles, I know I can't go wrong. He's there with me. On July 29, 1981, the wedding of the century had finally arrived. At Buckingham Palace, the Queen and Prince Philip set off in the procession bound for St. Paul's Cathedral. While Prince Charles was accompanied by his brother Andrew. Lady Diana, at just 20 years of age, emerged from Clarence House, ready to become the future Queen of England. Diana's silk wedding dress has since become an iconic moment in fashion history. Set against the drama of St. Paul's Cathedral and the British monarchy, Diana's ivory silk dress was suitably breathtaking, perfectly befitting a princess. Designed by David and Elizabeth Emmanuel, it featured a 25-foot train, 10,000 small pearls, elegant lace, and sequin detailing, and those iconic puff sleeves. However, the designers hadn't considered the glass carriage Diana would travel in, and when she arrived at St. Paul's Cathedral, her 9,000-pound dress was crumpled. Engaged on official duties and bound to a husband who had brought his fishing gear